Okay, so today we're going to continue modeling our own ideas. So just like last class, we're going to um, create some of our own shapes here. Um, and today it's going to be about the non-orthogonal blobby objects, for lack of a better term. So fuzzy objects, blobby objects, pillows, curtains, tablecloths, all of that kind of stuff. Uh, and so we're going to introduce some new tools today that allow us to model these non-orthogonal shapes. So thus far, the bulk of what we've done is, you know, flat surface, extrude the flat surface, you know, maybe chamfer the edge or, or, or what have you. And I think this is one of the challenges when you start to get into modeling complex shapes is understanding how do I work and manipulate with these shapes such that I can create the kinds of shapes that I want. And certainly, we're not going to be at a stage today where we're going to model a, like a bed sheet on top of a bed or a quilt where there's all kinds of undulations. We're not there yet. But we're going to work toward trying to create some realistic uh, organic type objects. And so I'm going to start today with a couch cushion, so the, the part that you sit on. And I'll walk you through how I would go about doing it, and then I'll snowball into other, other types of shapes, et cetera. Uh, and we're going to introduce a, a concept called a network surface. And we'll get to what that curved network is and how it, how it creates a surface. So uh, the first thing, as I start to create a shape, um, frequently what people do when they're trying to create a shape is they, they start with, OK, let me do a, oops, helps if I can type here. Let me do a base shape. And then let me start to try to manipulate that shape. And this works OK in some of the solid modeling programs where we can kind of push and pull as if this was a, a chunk of clay. But in Rhino, there's really there's not a good way of kind of making this feel like an organic shape. Even if we were to uh, fill it the surface with some kind of a, well, we'll leave it as a radius of 1. And I'd say, OK, yeah, I can take those two. And OK, well, that's a little better. And then I'll put those two together. And that's a little better. Maybe I could fill in the gap. It's still very rigid. And so we want to go about trying to create a shape that's not quite so rigid. And so what I'm going to do is I'll start with uh, some curves to try to create the definition of what this shape is going to look like. So I'll start with the rectangle tool, the basic rectangle tool. And I'm going to do a rectangle, uh, I don't know, we'll say at 18 inches, comma 18 inches for my base size. And before I get too far involved in this, I'm going to go ahead and explode that so I have individual lines. So I'll type explode like that. So each of these line segments is its own little piece. Now right now, this is just a straight line between two points. If I want to start to be able to manipulate this line, I can actually rebuild the control points on that line. So like I said, this is just two points. If I select the line and type Rebuild, it's available under Edit and then Rebuild. This Rebuild command allows me to change the point count and the degree of curvature of this curve. So if I change the point count, the default right here, this is what I have, is at 2. If I change the point count to, say, 3, for example, and I change the degree of curvature to 2, when I'm done, I'm going to end up with a control point right in the center there that I can start to manipulate. If I were to move that control point, you could see that I'm now starting to manipulate that what, what used to be a straight curve. Now if I rebuilt this further, if I said rebuild, and I said, you know what, give me five points, or maybe even seven points, I'm going to leave my degree set to two. We don't need a three-dimensional curvature. We'll just stick with two. And I say OK. It then rebuilds my shape such that I have a lot more control points along that. Now I can move any one of these individual points by a little bit, and I can start to create a very different shape. So let me go ahead. I'm going to step back again here. I'm going to rebuild these other curves. You don't have to do the rebuilds separately. So I can rebuild all the curves at once. Same thing, 7 and 2. And I'll go ahead and say OK. And now suddenly, all of these curves have been rebuilt so that they have uh, seven control points. Now, when I deselect, this is something that's new in, in Rhino 6. And that is that uh, when you select one of these curves, by default, it shows you the points on the curve, which is actually pretty nice. 
Unfortunately, I can't see both of these at the same time as easily. I can select them both, in which case I can see them both. Uh, but you're limited to whatever is currently selected versus seeing all of them. So let me go ahead and select two of these together. And it might even be easier to look down on the objects. Um, and it looks like if you select the objects using a box, you won't get the control points. If you select it individually and then press down Shift and select the other one, you will get the control points for what it's worth. If I'm looking at the top view here, I can select both of those, and then I can manipulate these two endpoints right here. So I've dragged a box around those endpoints, and I could pull those endpoints in. Oops, let me turn off ortho here for a second. And at some point, they're going to kind of meet as a nice smooth arc there. I can do the same thing for the other corners. So let me come back here. Let me select this one and this one. And I'm going to go ahead and select them all at once so I can just continue working with them. I'll select those two endpoints. And I'll pull this end in. Now there's a point at which it, it comes back on itself. I'm trying to find visually right about where that makes a nice smooth arc. It doesn't have to be perfect, but we're trying to get close. I can come down here. Looks like I need to select these two. I'll select those points. Same thing, we'll pull that one in. Oh, sorry, I'm stuck in Illustrator mode, and I keep pressing spacebar to, to uh, or InDesign to pan. So such is, such is the way today is going to go. All right, let me take this one, hold down Shift, and take that one. I'll select those two endpoints, and I'll pull them in as well. So if I were to look at this shape now, there we go, it's starting to feel a little bit more relaxed. I started with that nice rigid piece, and I'm starting to relax it a little bit. I've arced the corners in. Notice that I did each of the, instead of doing a fillet, for example, which I could have done, a fillet would have made the arcs perfect. Well, in real life, things aren't quite perfect. So instead of focusing on trying to make them perfect, I did them manually, which makes each of these slightly different, which is a good thing. So now the other thing I can do is I can look at one of these sides here, and I can say, you know what? Let's pull one of these in by a little bit. Maybe like that. So there's a little bit of an arc along that side. Maybe this one, I'll pull this and this out just a bit. Maybe like that. I'll take this one, I'll pull this middle one out just a little bit. And maybe I'll pull this one out just a little bit. So as we look at this cushion, you see that, or, or this set of curves that's going to eventually become a cushion, it's no longer a really rigid shape. We're, we're loosening it up along the way. And maybe I'll take this back one, and we'll push these guys out a little bit like that. Now, a large part of modeling these kinds of organic shapes is actually looking at shapes and observing them. So if you go home and you look at your couch, you look at what the cushion looks like, it'll help you figure out how to model it. So there's a lot of observation that goes into these. So I have those four curves set up here. I need the upper set of curves. So this is the lower set. I need an upper set. So if I take these, and I'm going to go ahead and copy them. So I'll go to Transform and then Copy. I'm going to choose Vertical. So I'll type V for Vertical or pick Vertical. And we'll go up by, let's say, 4 inches essentially the thickness of the, 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 the little cushion. And so now I have an exact copy of what was below above. Well, cushions generally aren't exact copies of each other, so we need to do some further manipulation of the top cushion versus the bottom cushion. The other thing that happens is this set of lines is perfectly flat right now. I can move these points in the z direction as well. So I could take any one of these. I could take, let's say, these two. And we'll move them, V vertical, up by just a little bit. Let me take the matching points over on this side. Move, V for vertical, and we'll put those up just a little bit. I could take this one, and I could put this and that point. I could move, V for vertical, and we could push them down just a little bit. 
And so I'm starting to manipulate these curves, both in the x, the y, and in the z direction. Likewise here, maybe these guys move v for vertical. We'll move them down just a little bit. And maybe it's time to start moving them a little bit differently. So let's take this point, and we'll pull it out just a little bit like that. Maybe this one and this are now coming back in a little bit. Maybe not quite that much. Sometimes you run into trouble with snapping in terms of how much or how little you want to move. And so I've worked my way, and I've manipulated the sides of this. So I've gone up and down in the z, and I've got, done the x and the y, and I now have kind of a, a rough outline of what I want created uh, if I were to create a surface. So the next challenge here is to start to understand how do I make these four curves turn into a surface. And we'd like to use these four outside edges to manipulate the surface itself. So I could take these four curves and patch the surface. But that's really trying to stretch a flat sheet across. We want to have a little bit more flexibility. So we're going to use a command called a curve network or a network surface. It's available under the surface command, and it's called curve network here. Now, you can go to surface and choose curve network. If you type it into the command line, it's network surface. So why they call it a curve network and a network surface, just to confuse you, I don't know. But it depends on whether you're, you're typing it in or not. So if you're typing it in, it's a network SRF. If you're going to it from the menu structure, it's under surface, and then curve network. And what it asks for is to select curves in the network. OK, that seems to make sense. So I could pick 1, 2, 3, and 4. And when I pick those four curves and I press Enter, it's going to build a surface. The default options here are just fine. It's going to build a surface that is relative to those outside edges. So it's not perfectly flat, stretched between. It actually kind of responds to my shape. You guys see that? This really doesn't have quite enough manipulation for my liking. So I can add a bit more to it. So I'm going to delete that for a second. Let me start by creating another line. This time I'll use my midpoint snap. I'll snap to the middle of this line, and I'll snap to the middle of that line. So I have this going across the center there. I can now rebuild it. I'll do the 7 and the 2 again. There's my control points. And now I can start to, to manipulate this as well. So let's imagine somebody were to sit on this. Maybe this is going to depress a bit. It's the butt depression. So it'll drop the cushion down. I'll drop this center, centermost point down a little bit more, like that. The stuffing has to go somewhere, so maybe I'll make this one come up just a little bit. Take those two, move V for vertical, and we'll draw those up just a little bit. Now I have that curve that can be part of the curve network. So if I were to take these curves and make a curve network out of them, I can once again go to surface curve network, and I can choose 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. I'll hit Enter. And it's now responding to all five of those curves. And you can actually see the butt depression starting to happen there. So I'm using these curves to tell Rhino how to build the surface. Now there is a trick to the way that Rhino deals with curve networks. And I'll, I'll try to illustrate it here. So if I drew a curve across that way, and I went to create a curve network, and I said, OK, that's great. I'm going to pick this, and this, and this, and this, and that, and press Enter, Rhino would say, unable to sort curves. Okay, the reason that it's unable to sort curves is it looks for curves that go roughly in the same direction. So this curve, and this curve, and this curve all roughly go in the y direction. This curve and this curve all roughly go in the x direction. So Rhino likes this kind of a setup. It doesn't matter. You could have it rotated. It's just generally in one direction. So when I say x and y, it doesn't have to be along the axis. It's just generally one direction and the other direction. When you break it and you have a line that goes 
in this case diagonally, Rhino doesn't know whether this line really belongs in the x direction or in the y direction. So it gets confused. So when you're creating these shapes, you really have to pay attention to the direction of the curves as we start to build them out. I can add to my complexity here by adding another curve that goes maybe from this is one point where I'm going to use the near snap. I'm very hesitant generally to use the near snap, but I'm, I'm doing it. There, there, and there. I use the near snap so I could actually snap to the points there. I'm going to rebuild this surface. And we'll rebuild it the same way. And I can manipulate this, these control points a little bit. I can move them V for vertical, and I can move them down a little bit, maybe even a little bit more, something like that. I'm exaggerating this shape a little bit so that you guys can see it. So that's great. But now we have a challenge here, and that is that these two points, those two lines don't intersect. So I don't know in Rhino 6, I haven't tried it in Rhino 6 yet, whether Rhino will just adapt to it or whether we're going to have to fix that problem. In uh, Rhino 5, you do have to fix the problem ahead of time. So I'm going to select all those curves, and we'll do a network surface with them. And it looks like, in this version, it adapts so you don't have to worry about it, which is absolutely fantastic news. So it's averaging out those two pieces, as opposed to in the old version in Rhino 5, so if you have that at home or whatever, you had to actually make sure those two curves intersect. They actually have a point that is the same. Um, in this world, we don't have to. It's averaging them. That makes life so much easier for us. So essentially, I've used all of these control curves to create that complicated surface that then represents where somebody would be sitting in this particular seat. Now, I can use the same set of strategies to build the bottom of this. So I could take 1, 2, 3, and 4, and I can do the network surface out of them. And I'll say, OK. Now, I didn't do any vertical manipulation of control points at the bottom because, generally speaking, the bottom of the cushion is flat. It's the top that gets distorted. So we'll leave that one flat for right now. Furthermore, I'm not rendering the bottom of the cushion, so I really don't care. When it comes to the sides of the cushion, we're going to use a very similar strategy. So I'll go ahead and come into the polyline here, and I'll snap right to that corner and right to that corner there. So I've gone to the corners of my shape, there and there. I'll repeat the process using a polyline from that corner to that corner there. Now, this curve plus that curve plus this curve plus that curve end up looking an awful lot like a curved network, right? It's just a different plane. So we're going to use the same command, surface curve network, to build out that part of the shape. Now, in this instance, a good question would be, what's the difference between this using this as a curved network and instead of doing it that way, just saying, let me pick this point and, or this line and this line and saying loft. We've done lofts before. What's the difference? The surfaces are actually identical in this context. However, a loft assumes a straight line between this curve and this curve, no matter what. I can't get any two-dimensional curvature. In reality, a cushion is always going to have a little bit of two-dimensional curvature. So we'll go ahead and add that in. Let me take this point, this line, and this line. I'm going to rebuild them. I don't need seven control points. We can go probably to just three. And I'll take this middle, and it's a lot easier to do this in the top view to see how it's working here. And I'm going to move it so that it sticks out a little bit. So if we look at it in this view, you can see that that's starting to arc out a little bit. I might even have to move it a little bit more, maybe like that. Same thing with this point right here. We'll select my point. Notice how I'm working in both views. It's easier to use both views to do this. I could just do my move here, but it's a lot harder to tell where it's, what's happening. In this view, it's much easier to tell where you're moving from and where you're moving to. So maybe it's about like that. Now that those arc out a little bit, I can do that same network surface for 1, 2, 3, and 4. 
And so that's nice because it's starting to arc out and be a little bit more uh, natural in its shape. So there's that. I'll continue on. Same thing. Right there to right there. I'll come over here, there, to there. I'll take each of these little curves. And I'll rebuild again. Three points is just fine. I'm going to move these the same that I just did. We'll go into the top view here. I'll pull that one out just a bit. Come back over to that curve there. Control point, move. Out like that. So on this opposite side, I can select those four control curves. Oops. Curve network. And OK. So I was able to create those two sides. Now on this back side, if you imagine somebody sitting in this seat, they'd probably push the stuffing out. So the middle of this would probably push out a bit more. So when I do it, I'm going to add a third curve. So we'll go midpoint to midpoint there. I'm going to rebuild this one again with three. I'll take my control point, And in this scenario, I'm really going to push this back. So we'll push it back pretty far to compensate for, for this part of it. So in this scenario, I end up with a curve here, a curve here, a curve here. Those are all roughly in the z direction in this case. And I have these two curves there and there, which are roughly in the x direction. And when I do the network surface, it will build that surface where it sticks out more in the back. Same thing for the front here, but maybe in the front you've got two legs, nothing in the center, so maybe I'll do two curves, one on either side. So I'm going to use my polyline tool, and again, this is where I'm turning on near snap, which I warn you is uh, risky. I'll create there's one, and there's one. I'll immediately go back and turn off my near snap so I don't get confused. We'll select each of these two curves. I will rebuild. I'll select that point, and we'll move it. Again, easier to do it in this view. And we'll pull that one out a bit, so about like that. This one here. And we'll pull that one out a bit like that. And then we can go ahead and do our curve network here. So one, two, three, four, all roughly in the z direction, five and six, both in the rough x direction. And then curve network. And I'll say OK. And now I have it where it pushes out more here, gets less here, and more here. And there, I was able to create a fairly organic shape based on some interpretations. Is it perfect? Does it follow the, the exact laws of gravity and whatever the universe? No, but it's a decent approximation. And that's what we're going for right now. So now that I've finished this, it's, a, it's time to go ahead and apply some kind of a material on it and take a look and see how it, how it turns out. So I'll go ahead and open up my V-Ray Asset Editor here. We'll expand it. I'm going to go into the Fabric section. And we'll look in here and see what we can find. Sure, let's use the purple. And I will apply all of that to this cushion. I'm going to do that using my layers. So I'll right click and say Apply Material uh, to Layer. It's going to be on the default layer right now. And at this point, I should probably rename my layers. I'll call that Couch Pillow. I'll get rid of the rest of the layers there. If I were to switch this over into my um, rendered mode, we could see what it looks like generally. I'm kind of confused why it's not purple, but 
Um, yeah, such as light. So we can see what the texture looks like. It's a little bit too big, so guess what? Texture mapping comes into play. So we'll go ahead and select this cushion. We'll go into my texture mapping. So we'll go into properties here. We'll go to texture mapping. This, like the rest of the shapes, is kind of box-like. So we may be able to get away with a box map. I'm going to try it and see. So I'll go ahead and click on box map, founding box, world, go ahead and cap it. And then I'll come over here to x equals y equals z to even out the texture, and we'll have a look. So it looks pretty good. The reason it looks pretty good is I was very careful about the corners. There's an error. You guys see that line right there? As the box map's applied, my line at the corner isn't exactly at 45. It's not exactly at the center of the box, so I'm getting a little bit of an artifacting there. Now, if I were to zoom it out and render it from here, would we be able to see it? Probably not. And I think that would be reasonable. So it may be easy enough and fast enough just to build it that way. The alternative to that would be to texture map each of these surfaces individually. And then there is going to be a seam there. Recognize that since this is fabric, there is always going to be some kind of a seam between the two fabrics. That's the nature of whenever you stitch something together. There's going to be a seam. The, the more adventurous the material is, if it has big flower patterns on it or something, it's going to be more and more obvious as to where those uh, seams occur. Sometimes people want to hide the seams, and you can do that with like a little bit of piping, and they do this in furniture and fabric and, and that sort of thing. I could create a little circle here. Let me switch back into shaded mode for the time being. I can create a little circle. Let's do a diameter of a quarter of an inch. There's my little curve. I'm going to rotate that so it stands up um, on edge. So I'll do a rotate 3D. Sorry, my bad. Come on. There you go, it's standing up there. Now, I'd like to rotate this so it's close to 45 when I'm looking down on it in the top view. So let me go ahead and rotate this. And we'll say this will be at about 45 degrees. Oops. There we go. So I'm looking for that surf circle to be kind of perpendicular to the edge. Does that kind of make sense? Uh, let me do a little bit more manipulation on it. I'm going to move it V for vertical so that it sits up a little bit higher in relation to my surrounding curves. I am going to let it intersect just a bit. Now I can use my sweep command. You guys have used this before. I'll do sweep one rail. Now my edges are not continuous. So I can either select all of my edges and join them together, or I can use this chain edges command, which will allow me to go through and select the first part of the rail, the second part of the rail, the third part of the rail, and the fourth part of the rail right there. When I'm done, I'll press Enter. And then I'll go ahead and select my cross-sectional curve. There would be the little cross-sectional curve. I'll press Enter. It'll ask me for the seam. That's fine. I'll press Enter one more time. And it will go around my object with that little bit of piping. If I were to switch this over into uh, rendered mode, we'd see that little edge go all the way around. Sometimes, depending on your shape, I'm going to switch back into shaded so we can see it, there are errors in the corners. So we can see it there. There's a little bit of an overlap in that corner. There's a little bit of a gap. Again, a little bit of a problem here. A little bit of a problem right there where the two come together. The truth is that when I render this from any reasonable difference distance, so let's say right there, it's going to render out just fine and I'm not going to worry about it. If yours are glaringly off, you might have to go in and do some trimming to get them to come together. It's kind of like we did with the uh, chamfered surfaces where we had to put the triangle in and, and manually adjust it and fix it. So it's something that's available to you. I'm going to take that curve and I'll do piping along the bottom just for consistency purposes. Let me take that curve here. I'm going to copy it 
and we'll drop it right there. I'm going to sweep one rail. My rails are going to chain. Oops, I forgot to select chain. Chain edges, there we go. We'll go one, two, three, and four. I'll press enter. Cross-sectional curve is right there. Enter, and then one more enter. And that just the little piping at the bottom. So now if I were to switch over into rendered mode, right, I have pretty good end results. You may have to take these little um, piping and adjust the, the texture mapping on those. They don't look too far off. They look maybe slightly big. Well, not too bad. So I might just take them and let me go into my texture mapping. And I might just adjust the UVW repeat up a bit. Just to, yeah, just to shrink down the pattern just a little bit. So visually, they look more appropriate. So now that this whole thing is done, I'm going to go ahead and save it. So I'll go to File and then Save. And we'll drop it into my flash drive for today. Uh, let me create a new folder for today. I'll click Save. And we'd like to confirm that this renders out nicely. So I'm going to go ahead and go back to the course website. Um, we'll go to today's, sorry, that's the next class. There we go. And we should have, there's that base file for test rendering. Remember we used it last class? Same thing. We'll go ahead and download it. And we can then open it up. Maybe. And I can bring that cushion in to take a look at the rendering. So I'll go to File, and then Insert. Or I could go to Edit, Blocks, Insert Block Instance. I will browse for that pillow that I just created. helps if you pick the right folder here. There it is. And we'll go ahead and say open. Good. It's going to be linked as a reference. I'll say OK and OK. I'll drop it in. We'll get it set up and ready for render. And then I'll go ahead and open the V-Ray Acid Editor and then turn on the rendering. And so the Rhino preview didn't show it to me in purple, but the, uh, the ultimate <laughs> cushion is in purple. I don't know if I can imagine a couch in this color, but I'm just saying. <laughs> Might be a little extreme. But we'll let this finish up, and we'll take a look at what it looks like so that we can confirm that it, it's looking the way we want it to. The texture mapping might be a little bit too big for this texture. Maybe I need to shrink it down. That's where you'd go back and make those adjustments. It actually does look a little bit big to me. So I'll change that UVW repeat to maybe like 1.5 to get it to repeat a little bit more often and make the fabric a little bit better. Uh, but that's essentially what we're looking for for the first cushion. So I want you guys to play around with that today. I will do some other cushions just so you can see how you would go about creating other um, options here. Let me jump back over into this file. I'm going to go, sorry, wrong one. There we go. I'll save it one more time. And then I'm going to go to File and then New. We use the large object inches template, and we're going to create a different type of pillow. So now on this type of pillow, it's the same kind of thing, but I'm going to do one of those throw pillows that go like on the back of the couch. And so it'll be set up a little bit differently. So I'll start again with my rectangle. And this time it's a little bit smaller, so we'll maybe do at 16, now let's do 14 inches, comma, 14 inches. So at 14 inches, comma, 14 inches. It gives me all four sides again. I'm going to explode it. That's a terrible sound. Uh, then I'm going to rebuild it. And we're going to say maybe by seven, just like we did last time. And so now as I select them, I'll work through the same process where I adjust the corners a bit. 
Now on these kinds of pillows, if you think about, and you guys are going to go home tonight, I hope, and start looking at things like pillows. Like, wait a minute, how does, what does the corner look like? Um, and you'll pay more attention. Uh, and when you do that, you'll get better and better at modeling these. So on the last cushion, I went and pulled it all the way in so it was rounded. Generally, these have a little bit of a corner to them. So I'm not going to go all the way. I'm going to just pinch it a little bit. And we'll come over here with this and with this. Same thing. I'll pinch that in just a bit. We'll take this one and this one. And we'll pinch that in just a bit. We'll take this and this and pinch that in just a bit. So the same general things apply where we want to think about what, what happens with the sides. Do we need to make any manipulations on the sides? Um, maybe these need to come out just a little bit. And my snaps are really wreaking havoc on me here. So we'll, we'll drop that out just a little bit. Put that out just a little bit. I can, by the way, if I keep having trouble with those snaps, you can disable all your snaps temporarily by click clicking that disable button, which will allow you to move these without worrying about the snaps so much. Now typically, yeah, 14 by 14. It doesn't really matter, whatever size seems right. Um, you know, sometimes people on their couches, they like to indent the top of the cushion a little bit. You know, on the top of the pillow, they push down on it. You get the idea. So we can think about that. We can manipulate that a little bit, uh, et cetera. Maybe it's a little bit uneven. So we'll push it down more on one side than the other, what have you. This last one, I'll manipulate just a little bit. We'll pull that in just a bit. Maybe about like that. So same as last time, where I created the four curves that go around, but this time, I don't want to just copy this vertically and have a second copy. This time, the pillow doesn't do that. The seams come together on the sides, and it arches up in the middle. So I'll go ahead, and I'll draw a line diagonally. Let me turn back on those snaps from there to there. I'll take this curve, and I'll rebuild it. Same thing with seven points. And I'll move all of these points up. I'll select them all first. Move V for vertical, and we'll pull them up. Then I need to deselect these two. Move V for vertical. We'll move those up a little bit more. Deselect. I'm holding down Control to do that. And move this last one. Oops, helps if you say vertical, V for vertical, and then up a little bit more. So essentially, I created that from a curve. So now, you guys should be at this point saying, wait a minute, we did this kind of diagonal curve and it didn't work last time when I tried to do the network surface. And you're right. If I took these four curves and I did a network surface, it would say unable to sort curves. But I have to just rethink how these curves are being applied. So right now I have this curve and this curve that are going in the, in this case, the x and the y direction. If I were to take this curve and this curve, sorry, and join them, those are now roughly going in this diagonal direction. And if I took this curve and this curve and I joined them, these are roughly going in this diagonal direction. So now I have one, two, three curves that are roughly going in the diagonal direction. I can do a network surface of those curves. Maybe not. It's going to make me have one more curve. Sorry. Forgot the one more. I still need one curve going in the opposite direction. So here's where the curve from this corner to this corner comes into play. So same thing. Rebuild. And I will move vertically. Maybe up there. Hopefully, Rhino will interpret for us. We'll take those two, move them, V for vertical. Looks like I went a little too high. Should have started at the bottom. All 
All right. So I have this curve, this curve, and this curve generally going in this direction. And I have this curve that's going in the opposite direction. It should allow me to build the network surface now. So the directions are rough, if that makes sense. So even though this starts here and goes out and comes back, it's still generally in that direction. And that's why it takes a little bit of getting used to, to see how you might be able to put these things together. And so when all that's done, let me switch over into my shaded mode, you see that we were able to create that style of pillow rather than uh, the, the lifted pillow. So I still have to build the other side of this shape. I'm going to cheat a little bit right now. And I'll take those two curves that I already created. I'll take this one and this one. And I would suggest for you guys you spend time to model the underside of the pillow too. But I'm just going to mirror them because you don't need to see me sit there and do it over and over again. I'm going to mirror them right down there on the bottom. And then I can take that, that, and that is in one direction. This curve is in the other direction. Curve network. And now I've created the other half of that pillow. So remember, I can manipulate these. So I could say, you know what? I want the pillow to be more squished in the middle. I could take these two. I could take that middle point. I can move them. V for vertical. And I could squish them in like that. And then I could do the network surface, same thing. And that would then cause the middle of this to be depressed. So you've got a lot of flexibility with how you, how you start to create these. Once you've created this one, this one really needs to stand up on edge a little bit. So I'll take this, I'll rotate 3D, and we'll go right along that axis, right along this axis, and we'll stand it up. In this scenario, maybe you don't want it standing all the way vertically. And maybe I want to rotate it, just a regular rotate. So it's, oops. I had to type the whole rotate. And maybe I want to pull it back just a little bit so it's off center. And now I have that little pillow. Same thing, I still have to texture map this. So in this scenario, it's a little bit more challenging on the texture mapping, uh, depending on how you create your object. So I'll select the object. I'll need to apply the material first. I'll go ahead and go into my materials. And uh, sure, why not? Let's do the green. <laughs> uh, let me right click and say apply material to layer. And we'll put it on the default layer. Same thing, I'm going to rename these. We'll call this throw pillow. We'll get rid of the rest of these layers because they're unnecessary. And then if we were to switch this into rendered mode, we'd see kind of a preview of our texture uh, of our pillow. Now this is always a little bit challenging because there are are inherently going to be seams in this pillow. So we have to decide how do we want to apply materials to it, where is the distortion going to occur, et cetera. Right now it looks like there's a seam that goes right along the center here, and that may or may not be desirable. If I took this and I went over into my properties and I went to texture mapping, you may decide that a surface mapping is the best strategy. So I'm doing just this one, and I'll apply a surface mapping. No, well, didn't really do much. Let me try a planar mapping to it. All right. So in that case, it again didn't didn't turn out exactly as I wanted it to, like that. But I can I can select it. I can view my mapping widget. There it is. And I could then start to manipulate that. We could use the gumball, and we could say, okay, let's rotate that a bit. Let's rotate this a bit. about there. 
And now it's looking pretty, pretty good on that particular piece. So I just used the, the texture mapping and then showed the mapping widget to, to control what it looks like. I'm going to change the UVW repeat pattern here. Uh, and I might go, uh, let's do two and see what it looks like. Yeah, it feels a little bit better. Now I like the mapping on this. The backside is very similar to it. So I'm going to go ahead and take the backside here and match my mapping to the front side there. And so now the front and the back should have roughly the same map mapping, so that looks pretty good. I can hide my mapping widget if we need to make it go away there. No, it doesn't want to hide for me. I'll hit escape a couple times. And so now I have that pillow set up. So we'll take a look at that same way we did the last time. So I'll save this. I'll go to file and then save. And this will be a throw pillow. Uh, and I'll say save. I'll jump over into my um, render file here. We can, since we're here, I could take a quick look at what the final rendering turned out like. Looks pretty good. I think it needs a little bit more texture mapping. That fabric is too big in its scale. So just a little bit of work, but it turned out OK. And now I could go in and I could, on this file, place in, I'll go to Edit, Blocks, Insert Block Instance. And I'm going to look for that throw pillow. It's going to be linked as a reference. I'll say OK and OK. And now I can drop that in there as well. It may take a little bit of manipulation here. Let's move it there. Let's move it vertically. So that it's coming up. And this may be a place where some gumball is helpful. So I could come into the gumball and I could say, OK, let's just tweak it down just a little bit. Let's move it down. You can see, OK, it's, it's hitting right about the same on the, that pillow. All right, that works. We'll have it sitting there. Obviously, I have no wall to prop it against, but I'm working to create the composition. So there's my object right there sitting one on top of the other, like that. And we can go ahead, open my uh, asset editor, and then start a new rendering that has both really ugly pillows on it. OK, so those are the first two, kind of going through pillows. I'm going to ask that you guys work through that. Now is the point in the lecture where I kind of snowball off into doing random stuff. Um, but we're also at a point where, depending on what you're trying to make, there's lots of different strategies for how you create things. So I want to show you a couple different things uh, from here that may or may not be useful to you, but such is life. Uh, the first one that I'm going to do is, let me jump back over into this. We'll save it one more time, and I'll go to File, and then New. I'm going to create like a set of curtains or drapes that hang along a window. I'll show you how to do that. We'll go to Large Object, and then Inches. And now, in the perspective view here, I'm going to go ahead and start with a polyline. And so I'll start at point zero, 00. I'll turn on ortho here for a second. And I'm going to go over, let's say, four feet, like that. Once I have that, let me turn off the gumball, I'm going to go ahead and I can choose to rebuild. And this time, we might rebuild with more pieces. Let's say uh, 15 pieces. Okay, So we get a lot more there. And now I'm going to pick every other one of these control points. There and there. So I've worked my way through. And then I will move all of those points a set distance. And you see when I do that, I start to create a little uh, undulating pattern here. So maybe I'll move them four inches. A mm, little bit more. Let's try, um, let's try eight inches. That feels a little bit better. Now, the first piece here and the last piece there probably wouldn't be all the way back against the wall. So they really need to move 
maybe halfway, so I'll do four inches for them. So they're moving about halfway. That's why I typed it in. Do you guys see how that came together? So I have those pieces, and if I were to take those pieces and copy them, V for vertical, uh, we could go up eight feet. And at this point, even a simple loft would build out what those curtains look like. So let me go into shaded mode there. Okay, That's pretty generic. They look pretty straight. They look pretty flat. In real life, that's not going to be the case. So now comes the time to start to do some manipulations on these. So I could start with the top ones remaining the same. And maybe on the bottom ones, uh, I want to start to make some edits to them. So maybe I take the middle group here, and I move them out. and out. Notice I'm keeping the same pattern with these as I select them. And so now that's floating out a bit from the wall. And so if I were to take this and take this, again I could do a loft here, and that would cause those to move out a little bit. That's still relatively straight. It might help to have these uh, have a little bit of curvature to them. So I could start with a vertical that goes from here to there. We're going to assume for a second that that one is staying consistent. I'm going to manipulate this edge out just a little bit further. Let's pull this one out like that, maybe. And then we'll take this one and go from that point up to that point. So now we're starting to look more like a curved network, true? So I could take these, there and there. I could rebuild them. I'm going to do it just as three points. And then I could start to manipulate what's happening on the sides. So maybe this one needs to move a little bit that way and a little bit that way. And this one here needs to move just a little bit that way. And so now I'll go, instead of doing the loft, I'm going to do the curve network. So we'll go up to surface and then curve network. And you can see that it's starting to respond and, and billow just a little bit. Now what about if we wanted this to start to come back a little bit more, like it was being held back? We can take this piece. We could take that control point. We can move this so that that comes back. I'm exaggerating this a little bit here. And we could go in and we could take these and we could have it so that it's being pulled back a bit. In that scenario, it might be better to take this piece here and scale 1D on it to pull that back just a little bit. Take this control point and move it like that, depending on how you're doing it. Likewise, maybe this whole thing, I'm again using scale 1D. Might be better if it's stretched out just a little bit. You can do that kind of a manipulation there as well. I'll move those control points to come back to there. Notice I'm paying, paying attention to all of these so that I can get them. It's being really annoying. There we go. To line up on the ends, which allows me to do the network surface again. So I'll go to surface, curve network. And that then starts to build. It's starting to get really hard for you guys to see it. Let me go ahead and apply a material to it. I'll go to the V-Ray Asset Editor. And um, sure, why not? We might as well put some red fabric on there. Uh, I'm going to right click. I'm going to say. Uh, apply material to layer. We'll put it on the default layer. And we could then look at it in rendered mode. And hopefully you'd see it a little bit better. Like that. So in this scenario, the texture is way off. So I, I minimum, I'm going to go into my texture mapping. I think a surface mapping is probably most appropriate for this. It's just mapping it directly to the surface. 
Uh, but my UVW repeat value is going to need to get a lot higher. Um, let's do it at maybe 4.0. And then you can see that the pattern got smaller. Actually, it might even need to be higher than that. Let's try eight. Yeah, that feels a little bit better. So when you're modeling these sorts of things, it's always about kind of observing and deciding what feels right, what doesn't feel right, how big should the folds be, uh, how, how controlled does this look, you know, do we need another control point so that this actually comes down and then in and then back out. Um, so you need some observations there. This, the strategies that I've talked about, though, still apply. So if I didn't like that, I could rebuild this again. Let's add another point. I could take this point, and I could pull that one back. Maybe over. A little bit more like that. And maybe this one gets, sorry, that one has to go up. So move V for vertical. Then we could drop that one up just a little bit. And maybe this ends up looking a bit more realistic. Like that. So you have to play around with it a little bit. OK? If I wanted to punch a, uh, a curtain rod through here, Sometimes you want to do that, something to hold the curtains in place. I could still do that. I'm going to switch back into shaded mode here for a second. Now in that scenario, I need a line that would go through my curtain. So there's my line. Let me move it vertically, and we'll say maybe negative 3 inches. So again, this goes down a little bit. Then I would need a circle on the end of that line. I'll switch into one of my side views here, my right side view, to do the diameter of the circle. So we'll say the diameter is an inch and a half. And I end up with that curve and that line right there. I need to be able to cut through all of those pieces. So I'll take this curve. I'll switch into that right side view again. I'll type trim. Oh, I have to project first, sorry. Uh, I have that in this view. I'm going to type project. I'll project onto this surface, which will give me all the little circles that I'm going to have to cut out. I can then come back to the right view here, type trim, and cut all of those circles out. And once I've done that, if we look at it in perspective, you can see that I was able to cut through all those. It's a little unrealistic because I cut half the curtain out here. It is what it is. I could spend a little bit more time working on that. Let me do the uh, curtain rod itself. I'll use a circle with a diameter. We'll go from there to there. Oops. I have to do this in, oh, come on. Do it right there. I'll use this as a sweep. So there's my rail. Sweep one, that. And I end up with a little curtain rod that then holds up the curtain. Okay. So all of these are skills that you have that you've played around with. Once I'm happy with this particular piece, same strategy, I would save it, drop it in, and do the rendering with it uh, as well. So I have that one. Let me save it. I'm going to show you one more thing. Um, let's call this a curtain. Perfect. And then I'll go to File, and then New. And I'm going to show you one thing. And this is different than previous classes, because we finally updated to Rhino 6. So there's a new command that's awesome. Okay. Anybody know what a catenary curve is? No? Everybody's blank. Okay. Imagine you had a string. And you tied one end of the string to that door, and I held the other end of the string. It forms a natural arc as it goes from one end to the other. 
The tauter I pull it, the tighter the arc becomes, but there's always an arc. The closer I walk to the door, the deeper the arc becomes. Rhino has the ability to create that arc now. So if we're thinking about hanging something, we can create the right curve for hanging an object. So let's imagine that I wanted to hang a piece of cloth, for example. I can come in here and I can create some basic um, pieces to give me myself a guide. So let me type 0, 0 right there. And my next point, I want to go up by, we'll say, 6 feet right there. I'll take this, I'll copy it, and we'll put it over by maybe 4 feet. There we go. I'll take these two pieces, I'll copy them, and we'll put them over uh, by 8 feet. And then I'm going to move this in by a foot. Oops. And I'll move this one in by one foot as well. Okay, so I have the outer ones and the inner ones. And let's add some complexity to it. Let's make these ones a little taller. I'm going to use the scale 1D command. I'll go to transform, scale 1D. And we'll go from there to there, and we'll say these are now 10 feet tall. Now, well, that might be a little tall, maybe 8 feet. OK, so I've given myself a guide. Now, when it comes to creating these curves, the command is catenary. It's under curve, and I actually don't know where they hide it. I'm going to have to find it. I'm not sure where it is. It's in there somewhere. But you can type in catenary. And when I initiate the catenary command, we have two different modes. We have a mode for length. Actually, we have a couple different modes. We have through point, length, parameter, and apex. We're going to use length today. And the reason that we're going to use length is it allows us to specify the length of, essentially, the string that we're creating. So I'll use length. My start is going to be right here. My end of the catenary is going to be up here. Then it asks for the catenary axis direction. This is essentially which direction, where do you want it to droop? So in this scenario, I'm going to click and snap so that it's going down the bottom. Then it says, what's my length going to be? So this length is going to control, let me turn off ortho for just a second. It's going to control how much this droops. So we'll say a length of maybe, uh, I don't know, 100. Now well, that wasn't too exciting. We'll do another one. I'll go from there to there. My direction is down. And we'll say this is um, 130. And that's in inches. So there it is at 130 inches. I can repeat the catenary. You see it hanging there? That's as if it was a string hanging. I can repeat that catenary. So same thing, catenary. We can go from here to there. We'll go straight down. Uh, same distance, 130. And that creates that side of the fabric. We'll do another catenary from here to there. And this one's going to be a lot shorter. So instead of 130, this one might be 60. And then we'll go from here to here my direction down, and this is going to be even shorter still. We might do 40 this time, and there we are. So these, 1, 2, 3, and 4, should look kind of familiar, right? Network surface, anybody? There we go. Surface, curve network, and now we have as if we were hanging a sheet between those control points. Kind of make sense? Really cool to finally have the ability to do that. Before, you always had to approximate it. Now we can get those actual arcs, and we can build out what this would be. So Rhino, unfortunately, can't unroll this surface. It's a doubly curved surface. But this is essentially an approximation of if I had a sheet that was 130 inches long and uh, 60 inches and 40 inches on those two sides, and I were to hang it there, this is approximately the shape we'd get. And that's the goal. Again, we're trying to approximate things. So that's another option You know, if you wanted to make a hammock or, or whatever. We ha now have the ability to create that sort of uh, an object. 
Okay, so I know I talked for a long time today, but I'm trying to throw different ideas at you. When you go to create your objects today, I would start with those basic pillows. See if you can get those kind of mastered, and then start to play around with these. I'm showing you these so that they can help you with your assignment. If you finish the, the basic pillows, move on to try to create a pillow that works for your assignment. See how that then folds in and informs your decisions for that part of it. So you have plenty of work to do. If you run into any questions, let me know and go for it.